Hi class, this is Mr. Hahn. This is the lecture for the last class of the year on May 18th, 2020. For the last couple of years, I've, I've liked to do a last lecture that doesn't have to do with anything that we've read this year specifically, but it has to do with reading in general. So some guidelines or some thoughts about reading to close out our year. Last year I had 25 different thoughts about reading. This year I only have 15. You don't have to take notes since this is recorded and you can refer to it anytime you want, but you may want to take down one or two things that you find interesting that you think you might want to apply. So here we go. This is kind of my charge to you about developing a life of reading beyond this year. So number one is to require yourself to reread the books that we read this year once in the next 10 years. So that means rereading Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, Virgil's Aeneid, and the, the tragedies of Sophocles. Reading those again at least once in the next 10 years. Don't let this year be the only time that you read those books. These are foundational books that have shaped centuries of thought. And you may have liked reading them, you may not have liked reading them, but you certainly only dipped your toe into the pool just a little bit in your reading this year. I encourage you to reread those uh, at least once in the next 10 years, and then hopefully beyond that. Number two is read every book as if you may reread it. So that means don't come to a formal judgment about a book while you're reading it. Read it as if you may reread it at some point. Have an ongoing conversation within the book. Don't worry about being exhaustive. Don't try to figure out everything that's going on in a book. Just read it and say, okay, there's a lot there that I didn't get to, that I didn't quite understand, and so I'm going to reread it at some point. It may be a year, it may be two years, it may be five years. But read it with an attitude of a beginner that you're reading it for the first time and not the last time. Now, not every book is going to repay that kind of trust. You may get to the end of a book and it may be the kind of thing that history has not said it's a great book. It's not in the great books list for Mars Hill and it's just something that you picked up at the library. It may not deserve being reread, but you, while you're reading it, you can still have the attitude of approaching it with humility and saying, I, I think there's something here that I want to apprehend. So read every book as if you may reread it. Number three, talk about what you read with other readers. It's reading is typically a solitary activity. It's something you do by yourself, but talk about your reading with other people. And, and one great way to do this is to join a book club. Read something, you're all reading it together and you discuss it and talk about it. Mars Hill English classes are not book clubs. Book clubs have different goals. They read just for enrichment, and, and you can follow your thoughts wherever you want. And you don't, there's nothing particular that you have to get when you're in a book club. When you're in a Mars Hill English class, we're trying to cover specific ground. We're trying to show what the author was, the, the time in which the author was living, and the kinds of things that the author was responding to. And it's not the same as a book club. So talk about what you read with other readers. Number four, read when you have, quote, better options, when you have better things that you can be doing. Use that time sometimes to read. In other words, don't make reading a last resort activity, just something you do when it's raining and there's nothing on TV, there's nothing going on, and you say, well, I guess I'll read. That is not the way to develop a, a reading lifestyle. Read when you have better options. Make it something that enriches your life. And, and you won't be disappointed by doing so. Feed yourself good books. Find good books. The Mars Hill reading list is one of those. Uh, it's a list that has good books, but there are books that are not in our reading list that are also good books. Feed yourself good books. And do so when you can be doing other things. Okay, number five, get a book weight. What's a book weight? Well, you may have seen me bring this to class this year. It's a pretty simple thing. I bought it for $10 at Barnes & Noble 
several years ago, maybe 15, 16 years ago. Wasn't quite sure if I would use it, but it looked interesting, so I bought it. And what it does is when you have a book that will not on its own lie flat, you use the book weight when you're reading or when you're taking notes and copying notes down, and it will allow your book to lie flat. It's an incredibly inexpensive and yet very valuable tool, especially when you have big books that don't stay open very well at all. So I advise you get a book weight. It might be $10. And as a bonus, uh, if you're ever reading and somebody attacks you, it comes in very handy as, as something that you can retaliate with. It's got, some, it's got some weight on there. All right, so that's number five. Get a book weight. Number six, have a reading table or a reading desk. Somewhere where you're sitting straight and you have your book in front of you on a table or a desk. And that's where you go to read. There are, there's a problem with trying to read in a very comfortable chair or trying to read in bed. And that's that you'll be so relaxed that you won't be able to concentrate and you'll just want to take a nap. But if you're reading in an environment that is designed to keep you awake, you're going to be able to pay attention to your reading and you're going to, you're going to comprehend what you're reading better. So have a reading table or a reading desk. Make that the place where you read. Number seven, write the dates in which you read a book in the front of the book. So every time I read a book, I on the bookmark, I write the date that I start the book. And then when I finish a book, I write the starting date and the end date in the front of the book. So this is a book, it's called Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. I bought it in 1999. And as you can see here, I have the dates in which I read the book on one of the front pages. So I first read this in January. It looks like it was uh, January 15th to April 8th, 2000. So I read this 20 years ago. And then I read it, I've read it two other times. And one of the reasons I do this is because I like to know when I read stuff. And I like to know what kinds of books I was reading at different times in my life. And sometimes, just for nostalgia's sake, I like to go into my bookshelves, pull out a book, see when I read something, see the kinds of things that I wrote in the book or highlighted. And so I advise you to, uh, to write the dates in your book. And of course, you have to own the book in order to do that. You can't do that in library books, and you can't really do that with audiobooks either. Okay, number eight. Buy physical books that you can mark up and keep. So this is a derivative from writing the dates in your book. Buy physical books that you can write in and keep. Uh, to me, that is having a library. You can have a digital library, but it's just not the same thing. And this may be a personal thing, but I think there's just great pleasure in physically holding a book, thumbing through its pages, and, and reading it. And it's something that can't happen the same way with a tablet or with an audiobook. So buy physical books that you can mark in, because when you mark in, you're paying attention to what you're reading, you're asking questions, you're interacting with the book, and that you can keep. So I do use library books sometimes. I will read I will check out books from the library and read them if they're the kind of book that I don't think I'm really interested in spending money to own. Um, and I do sometimes use audiobooks. That's a different point that I'll get to. I very, very seldom borrow books from people because I can't write in them. And uh, I just, I, I want to actually have the book, know it's mine, write in it. And, and it's, it's a piece of me, it's a piece of my library. So buy physical books that you can write in and keep. Think in terms of having a library. Number nine, get in a reading mindset. When you go to read, have a reading mindset. And that means to understand that what you're doing is serious work. You are using your mind, you're using your intellect to understand what an author is wanting to communicate to you. And especially if you're reading fiction, you're building a world in your head. You're building what the environment looks like based on the description that the author gives you. That's serious work. And, and it requires a focused attention. And so because it's serious work, 
make sure that you undertake it seriously. Put away your tech distractions. Don't try to read when you have your phone with you or your tablet or something. That's another reason why I don't like to read on tablets is there are too many other distractions with the tablet. There's notifications, there's all kinds of apps and things there. There's email. And so put away your tech distractions. When you go to read, undertake it as serious work. And especially if you're sitting at your reading desk, then you can give your full attention to it and you can make the most of it. Number 10, don't rule out majoring in English. Don't rule out majoring in English. There's a lot of bad press about English majors that you can't do anything once you graduate, you can't get a job, and everything is pushing toward STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math, and that everybody needs to be going into STEM so that they can be engineers or computer scientists or doctors or, or things like that. And I work in the U University of Kentucky College of Engineering. I'm not against STEM, but I don't believe that STEM is where everybody needs to be going. There are people who have an appreciation for literature, who love to read and who love to reread what they read and who love to interact with the thought and develop their own thought about what they're reading. And those kind of people make good English majors. And we need good English majors because there are too many English majors who who then get into really faddish modes of thinking about literature and they focus on very minute parts of books and authors and time periods and stuff. And so we need, we need good English majors. Um, one of the beautiful things about a good English major at a good school is that you get a broad survey of a lot of different kinds of literature and you can, uh, you can read from all different periods and, and different continents and, you get a broad exposure to it in a way that we, we begin to do in Mars Hill, but uh, you can take further through an English major. And you will get a job if you're a good student and you get good grades and you show that you can communicate through writing and through verbal communication that you have a brain and you can think and you can process things and you can communicate. Number 11, when you read a book, when you finish a book, Refuse to say, that was boring. Even if the book did not interest you very much, don't say, that was boring. Because more than likely, you're boring, and you don't quite have the imaginative equipment to make the best use of that book. Yield yourself to a book fully while you're reading it, and when you finish, decide what you think about it. And if you think, you know what? I just don't know what was going on there. It really didn't captivate my interest. I didn't like the characters. That's fine. But to read something and to get to the end of it and say, that's boring, that's not a good evaluation of a book. And in Mr. Hughes's 11th grade English class, you'll read Mortimer Adler's How to Read a Book. And that will go into greater depth about how to interact with a work of literature and to get the most out of it. Number 12, have a to-read pile and a just-read pile. So what this means is there's stuff that you're reading, probably for school and maybe for on your own, but also keep a pile of books around that you intend to read. You might not read them right away. It could be some time. But keep a pile of books around that you... that. You just keep referring to it as, you know what, I am going to read that book at some point. I've, I've bought books at half price books. half price books is your friend because you can buy books there that are inexpensive and, and not feel like you have to read them right away. So you can pick up a book at half price books, you put it in your to-read pile, and a month goes by and you look at it and you see it's there and you're like, yep, yeah, I'm going to read that at some point, but not right now. It's, I'm just, it's just not the time. And then you'll hear a lecture or you'll talk to somebody or you'll read something and it refers to that book. And then you're like, ah, now's the time. Now I'm going to read that book. It's handy to have piles of books like that around that eventually you're going to get to. And then have a just read pile. And what that means is when you finish a book, don't put it back on the shelf right away or return it to the library or give it back to a friend. Keep it around so that it stays in your thoughts. Keep thinking about the book here and there and refer to certain passages maybe that you underlined, go back through, maybe think about what the, the things that really grabbed you were in that book. 
So don't shelve it right away, but keep it around. Have a just red pile. It allows, it allows your brain to diffuse that information that you took in over a short period of time and it kind of spreads it out in your consciousness and well more really more your unconsciousness and then things will come back and they'll 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 just kind of pop into your mind at times and you'll you'll have thoughts that you didn't consciously have while you were reading the book so have a to read pile and a just read pile number 13 so this year you read homer you read Virgil, you read Sophocles. Feel free to read some fluff this summer. It's okay. You can read fluff. You don't always have to be reading serious works of literature. Now, you will have to read Dante's Divine Comedy this summer as uh, the Mars Hill Summertime read for 10th grade. That is not fluff, and that will require serious engagement. But in addition to that, feel free to read some fluff. Every summer, I read a book by a British author named P.G. Woodhouse, and I'm going to talk about him in a little bit. But P.G. Woodhouse wrote a series of books around two figures. Uh, one is, uh, a, for lack of a better term, a butler named Jeeves, and the, the person that he serves, whose name is Bertie Wooster. And they're, they're funny books. They're well-written. Uh, they have very memorable lines. They are not serious works of literature, and every summer I make sure I read at least one P.G. Woodhouse book. So it's kind of like if you're into eating good food regularly, you know, you eat your vegetables, you eat your fruit, you, eat, you know, you make sure that you're not eating too many sweets. And it, if you do that, it's fine to eat Funyuns and drink Coca-Cola. You can do that. What you can't do is eat that all and drink that all the time. If you have a diet only of Funyuns and Coke, you're gonna get sick. And and if you're only reading fluff, your your mind is going to not be able to hold serious thoughts together. You're not gonna get a good picture of how the world works. But every now and then, there's nothing wrong with reading some fluff. Number fourteen. Audiobooks are good for the big stuff. So I'm not against audiobooks. I, re I use audiobooks for histories, for large biographies. I'm talking seven, eight hundred page biographies that I just would not probably persevere to sit down and read over a couple months. And really large novels. Last spring, a year ago spring, I listened to Charles Dickens's David Copperfield, which is about seven, eight hundred pages. And it's a wonderful book, and I do actually want to go back and reread it. But for the first time through, I listened to it on audio, and it was something like 27 hours. But it was great to be able to get through it when I was running, when I was driving, when I was cutting the grass, and be able to take it in in a much shorter time than it would have taken if I had tried to read the book. So audiobooks are good, but use them for the big stuff. And finally, number 15, I have five book recommendations for you. You can use these during the summer or you can use them at any time. But these are five book recommendations that I have for you. So the first one is Kenneth Graham's The Wind in the Willows, which I believe he wrote in the early 1900s. You may have read this book before, but it's about four animals who are friends there's rat, mole, badger, and toad. Toad is the most colorful figure. He's constantly getting into trouble. But beyond toad's slapstick antics, there, there's some really profound stuff about belonging to a place and living in a place and what that means for some of the characters and how they, they rally around a friend who is in need and they fight to the death on his behalf. It's a great book. I strongly advise if you read The Wind in the Willows to get an illustrated version of the book. This one is illustrated by Michael Haig, who is fantastic. He's illustrated other books and, and does a, an amazing job. And so uh, I, I, there's another guy, his last name is Ingpen, but uh, there, there are other illustrated versions. I highly recommend the illustrated version of The Wind in the Willows. This was my favorite book of 2018. I read about 50 books that year. This was my favorite book. I read it in early January of that year, and when I finished, I said, more than likely, no matter what I read this year, this is going to be my favorite book. 
and it was. So, The Wind in the Willows, that's recommendation number one. Number two is the author I was talking about earlier, P.G. Woodhouse. And this is uh, one of his Jeeves books. It's, it's actually three books in one. There's two novels, and then there's a book of short stories, about ten short stories. This is called Just Enough Jeeves. It's a very large book. Um, you can see how thick it is. You don't have to get this particular one. There are many P.G. Woodhouse books in the Jeeves series that are smaller. I liked this one. This was the first Woodhouse book I ever read. I read it in 2014, and I liked it because it had the two novels. It had all the short stories, so I felt like I was getting an immersive experience of reading Woodhouse, and uh, just delightful humor and uh, Bertie Wooster gets into all kinds of problems, and Jeeves has to figure out creative ways to bail him out. So I, I highly recommend this as a summer read. The third recommendation is H. Ryder Haggard's classic, King Solomon's Mines. Ryder Haggard wrote, I believe, in the late 1800s. King Solomon's Mines was a favorite of C.S. Lewis. He uh, Lewis read it several times when he was a boy, and it shaped his imagination. And so this is a, a very compelling book about searching for King Solomon's mines in the heart of Africa. And uh, so I, I very much recommend this. And uh, you can find it inexpensively. This is a Barnes & Noble copy that new was $9. You can fi probably find it very inexpensive used online, or when Half Price Books opens again, you can probably find it there. The fourth book is The Complete Fairy Tales of George MacDonald. George MacDonald uh, was a huge influence on C.S. Lewis. MacDonald was long dead. Well, not long dead, but he was dead by the time Lewis began reading him. And MacDonald's fairy tales are incredibly captivating and very profound. And this volume has some of the best ones. And so I recommend it. It has The Wise Woman. It has uh, The Day Boy and the Night Girl. It has um, The Giant's Heart. It really has great stuff. And so I, I highly recommend that you get George MacDonald's The Complete Fairy Tales. And then finally, this is a shameless plug for my son, Samuel Hahn. He wrote a book called The Man of Twists and Turns last year and self-published it on Amazon.com. It's a futuristic, it's a science fiction version of the Odyssey, where the main character, whose name is Gordon Drummer, is trying to get home from 3,000 years in the future. And a lot of the perils that he encounters along the way mirror the perils in the Odyssey in, in creative ways. And uh, in some ways, I'm recommending the book but I'm also recommending it to show you that these days publishing a book is very, it's very accessible for anybody. And so if you like to write, if you like to develop stories, you can, sell, you can publish your own book and have it on Amazon and people can buy it and read it. And, and who knows, uh, a lot of people may end up liking it and wanting to read it and sharing it with their friends. So those are my book recommendations for this year. And that's my 15th point. And so, usually I get to say goodbye to my class in person. That's not going to happen this year. It has to happen through video. I want to thank you all for being part of the class this year. And I wish you all the best this summer. Enjoy your summer. I hope that we can reconvene in person in the fall as Mars Hill Academy. And best of luck to you next year in Mr. Hughes's 10th grade class, which covers medieval literature, British literature, and you'll be reading Dante and Chaucer and Beowulf and all kinds of great things. Give Dante your very best and persevere with it. Stick with it. I've read the Divine Comedy twice in the last five years. And every time I see it on my shelves, I think I can't wait until I read it again. And I hope you have the same experience. All the best to you. God bless.